Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Philosophy of Cognitive Science with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. Today's lecture covers part of the chapter in Clark's book on enactivism. This chapter is entitled Enacting Visual Perception, and I am going to do a brief lecture on enactivism because we have come to the end of the semester, and um, I'm positive that you're all uh, way too busy to sit through two one-hour lectures on this topic. This is a bit of a radical topic, uh, an activism and the strong sensory motor model of perception is a bit of a radical theory, much like uh, some of the work on dynamics and the extended mind that we've talked about. But it also can be a little bit difficult to kind of wrap your head around because it's, it's, it's just such a different way of thinking about how perception, in this case we're talking about visual perception, but uh, it's such a radical way uh, of thinking about all kinds of perception that um, people can sometimes have a bit of trouble uh, getting it. And, and, uh, and I, I was one of those people. I, I think that on my first encounter with the view of an activism uh, that we're going to encounter here, back in my early days of uh, graduate school, uh, it sounded a little strange, and it took a few readings to really get what um, the essence of the idea is here. So we're just going to do a brief lecture on enacting visual perception, and my aim with this lecture is just to kind of make you aware of this theory. Um, we're not going to cover the discussion section, we're not even going to cover all of the sketches section, even though the sketches section is quite short. I'm only going to cover the first two-thirds of it. Um, and this is also because, even though we've run out of time, I still want to wrap up the course, and I have a few things to say about consciousness as well. So uh, that lecture will be up uh, probably in a day or so. Um, you probably don't need to watch it if you're pressed for time. But if you are interested in theories of perception or unconsciousness with respect to, you know, your, your final paper and writing your final paper, or if you want to do a bonus critical response on one of these topics, uh, that's what this is for. So this is just a nice way to briefly wrap up the course. So um, with that said, let's dive into it and talk about what exactly inactivism and uh, the strong sensory motor model of visual perception are. What is it uh, to say? What does it mean to say that we enact our visual uh, experience? Well, let's dive in and take a look now. Probably the easiest way to understand um, this kind of enactivist account of perception is just to compare it to more traditional theories of perception. And remember, when I, when I say perception, I'm talking primarily here about visual perception, because that is what Clark is talking about, and it's what certain inactivist theorists like Alda Noe, whose work we'll be talking about here, tend to focus on. But we can talk about uh, enacting perception in other sense modalities as well. It's just, you know, to keep it simple, we'll limit ourselves to visual perception. So, traditional theories of perception treat perceiving the world as something passive in the sense that, um, you know, it's something that happens to us, right? I don't have to try and perceive uh, all of this around me. It just kind of happens, right? I open my eyes, information travels through the optic nerves to my visual, uh, visual centers of my brain and my occipital cortex back here. And, um, you know, uh, eventually we end up with a nice, rich, um, inner representation of the world, or so it seems. Now, one thing you might recall here is the, uh, the idea of perception as something like a photograph or a snapshot, right? So if you just take a minute right now, wherever you are, look around the room, or if you're outside, look around the scene, I should say. Look around. It's like a very rich, detailed uh, you know, representation of the world. That, you're encountered, uh, that you encounter here. Very rich, very detailed, and it seems almost like uh, it's like a movie in your head, or a snapshot, perhaps. 
that your brain has taken. And, uh, you know, you can dart around. I can, I can look over here at some books on my bookshelf, and um, my brain seems to be still constructing a rich, detailed uh, model of the world over here in my peripheral vision. So, no problem, right? So, um, traditionally, perception is treated as something passive, uh, and certainly something that's inner, right? Um, most uh, theorists that I'm aware of argue for some kind of um, indirect realism when it comes to experience, right? We're not seeing the things in themselves out there in the world when we perceive. Our brain is creating a detailed inner model of the world. So, like you know, like a snapshot or a movie in your head. And perhaps you can recall the snapshot, you can uh, scan it with your attention in your mind's eye, you can scan this detailed visual representation with your uh, regular eyes in the real world, and it seems like a big, rich representation uh, that's, that's there, right? No matter if I'm looking over here, all of this stuff over here is still there on, my periphery, on the periphery of my vision, right? So, um, this, is, uh, this is kind of like uh, a good way to, I guess, maybe it's a bit of a caricature, um, but it's a simple way to characterize these traditional notions of perception, right? Our brain makes a detailed model of the world, and uh, it's an inner model, and it, it just kind of happens. Our brain just does it. We don't have to try to do it. So it's passive and it's internal. Now we know there are problems with this though. We've already encountered problems with this sort of uh, snapshot conception of visual perception. Um, we've seen, uh, we haven't talked about it in any detail or very much detail in this class, but we have seen that phenomena like change blindness or inattentional blindness uh, give us reasons to question this snapshot understanding, right? And recall briefly that change blindness is um, a failure to notice a change in a visual scene when that change occurs during a saccade, right? So that's when your eyes move from one point to another point suddenly. If I were to show you a picture on a computer screen and tell you to scan different parts of the picture with your eyes, then on one of those uh, one of those saccades that your eyes make, I could switch the picture and maybe this new picture would have like one extra feature that was missing from the first picture. And you would probably fail to notice the change if it took place during uh, one of these saccades because um, as we now know, when the eyes are saccading, they are not actually uh, well, it's not the eyes, but the optic nerves, the information doesn't reach uh, the visual cortex when our eyes saccade. When they track, like my eyes are doing now, tracking my fingers, yes, input is always going to the visual cortex. But when we saccade, um, this doesn't happen. Yet, we don't have the experience of the world suddenly going dark every time we, you know, uh, move our eyes around the scene. So the brain uh, seems to be creating a detailed model, but if it's a detailed model, then why do we fail to notice these changes, right? Similarly with inattentional blindness, if we're attending to one thing, we may fail to notice um, something that would otherwise be very salient. And this is, of course, the example given by the, um, you know, the, the monkey business illusion, where we have the two basketball teams. Maybe we have, you know, a red team and a blue team, and you're told to count the passes the blue team makes, and you're counting these passes, and a man in a gorilla suit comes out, and most people who are attending to what they've been told to attend to fail to notice the gorilla. So change blindness, inattentional blindness, also the foveal blind spot. Um, there, uh, you know, on, on the back of your eye, where the optic nerves kind of uh, leave the eye and travel to the brain, you don't have any photoreceptors there. And this means that there's actually a blind spot uh, on the back of your eyes, on your foveas, right? So um, you can identify this. You can actually download... Um, uh, images that you can print out and hold up to your face that will 
allow you to actually experience your foveal blind spot. But in your day-to-day -day lives, you don't go around with, uh, you know, these, these uh, blind spots in your vision, right? Your brain seems to fill it in somehow, right? So um, we don't seem to be getting this rich, detailed representation of the world as much as we perhaps think we do based on our day-to-day -day experience. Nonetheless, that's a kind of, um, I say, I'm saying it's a way to characterize the, the more traditional way of looking at visual perception. Perhaps I'm caricaturizing it rather than characterizing it. Uh, I don't mean to be uncharitable to anyone who holds a more traditional view here. Um, but that is the traditional view. There are uh, lines of evidence that suggest that the traditional view is not right. Um, but an activism, whatever you think about what change blindness or inattentional blindness mean for a theory of perception, uh, inactivism is a very different, um, a very different theory of perception. On inactivism, what I'm calling inactivism here, uh, perceptual experience is enacted. It's something we do. It's enacted by skilled sensory motor behavior and implicit sensory motor knowledge. And we'll unpack this a bit as we go. Um, but according to Alva Noe, who is a, one of the leading advocates of inactivism, there are others, uh, Kevin O'Regan, um, Evan Thompson, uh, if you're interested in looking into other big names who are uh, kind of like in, in that inactivist camp. Um, according to inactivism, and according to Alva Noe, who's like the inactivism leader, uh, perceptual experience gets its character, so it gets its kind of what its likeness, and it gets its content, what it's about, from the perceiver's implicit knowledge about how sensory stimulation changes as a result of movement. And that could be your movement or the movement of objects in the environment. So basically what that is saying is that the character and content of our visual perception is not you know, just something the brain does. Uh, the character and content of our visual perception is what it is because we all, as agents in the world, have a kind of implicit knowledge about the way uh, sense, sensory stimulation changes as we move about the world and interact with the world. All right, so that's inactivism in a nutshell, but this can be a little bit Mm, strange, if you're not used to thinking of perception this way. So let's see if we can break this down a little bit more with some more familiar examples. Now, Noah's theory of um, perception, his inactivist view of uh, visual experience, is uh, called by Clark the strong sensory motor model of perceptual experience. And here, as we saw before, um, perception and perceptual experience depends upon something pretty important. This is a key notion for Noe and other inactivists like O'Regan and uh, uh, Thompson for example. Uh, perceiving depends upon what uh, Noe used to call uh, the perceiving agent's sensory motor contingencies. More recently, he's taken to calling these sensory motor expectations, but these terms really mean the same thing. What these sensory motor contingencies are, or these sensory motor expectations, are relations between movement and uh, other kinds of change, namely, um, you know, uh, perhaps a change in some other condition in the environment besides, besides one's motion. Uh, it's, it's a relation between these things and sensory stimulation. So, um, we have these sensory motor contingencies or these sensory motor expectations, and these are, um, these contingencies or expectations concern how, um, 
uh, our sensory stimulation or, you know, what, what something is like, what this lamp is like, what this coffee is like, so on and so forth, um, uh, the relation between changes in this and changes in uh, movement, orientation, um, and different sorts of things like that. And I should mention, these sensory motor expectations, they're a kind of knowledge, but they're not an explicit kind of knowledge, right? It's not like my knowledge uh, that, um, I don't know, to take the old example from last time, it's not like my knowledge, uh, it's, it's not something I can report, like I can report that I know that Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada or something, right? It's something implicit, right? It's not something that we can easily verbal report, verbally report. It's more like a, a kind of know-how rather than a, a knowing that, if that makes sense. So we have this implicit knowledge of the way sensory stimulation changes when we move, when we reorient ourselves, when other things that we're looking at or attending to are moving, so on and so forth. And these sensory motor expectations are what link real world objects and the properties uh, that they have to changes in patterns of sensory stimulation. So there, there are these kinds of like uh, loop-like kind of things. We've talked about loops a lot in this class and here, here our, our loop of the day today is uh, kind of like uh, if you want to think of how objects appear smaller, the angular size of objects decreases the farther away they are. So that's a very simple example. So using my implicit knowledge of how my motion changes sensory stimulation in that regard, you know, my implicit knowledge there would be something like knowledge that if I back up or if the object I'm looking at is moving away from me, its angular size will decrease, right? And conversely, if I approach it or if it approaches me, its angular size will increase. Uh, basically, that's a fancy scientific way of saying it will look uh, bigger or smaller if we're coming closer together or getting farther away, right? So this means, according to Noe, all of this, uh, all of these details of the strong sensory motor model mean that inner representations, you know, the kinds of representations that we appeal to when we talk about the snapshot conception of visual experience, can't really explain the whole story when it comes to how perception works, because a key part of the story, according to Noe, um, is the way that these sensory motor expectations dictate how perceptual experience actually ends up being. All right? So um, that is kind of it for my summary of the strong sensory motor model. We could go into far more detail, but we are not going to because I'm trying to keep this lecture short. But I think before we finish up, we'll talk about a few things that I want you to keep in mind if you decide to think about this further. Um, and we'll kind of summarize the strong sensory motor model. And then I'm going to riff a little bit on some problems with it. All right, so let's get to that now. A couple of things to keep in mind. Um, well, one thing is that uh, the way in which um, we can think of these sensory motor contingencies or sensory motor um, expectations can be quite broad, right? Um, when, when we talk about movement, for example, as I mentioned a moment ago, movement might be the movement of the perceiving agent. And that movement could be the movement of her eyes. It could be the movement of your head. It could be the movement of her whole body moving back or forward or something, or it could be the movement of something in the um, environment that one is trying to track visually. You know, um, think of it like this, you know, think, think of uh, your dog, for example, if you have a dog, you know, uh, dogs can track objects just like we can. And if you're playing fetch with your dog, your dog is probably looking at the ball and trying to follow it just like you are. But... If your dog is confused by something, perhaps a squeaky toy noise coming from the television, as my dog often is confused by, uh, then perhaps your dog will kind of, you know, turn its head to the side like this. Why does your dog do that? Well, maybe one, one reason is because it's trying to, um, you know, get some inaction going there uh, to try to perceive whatever it's, whatever this squeaky thing is, 
in a way such that the dog can, you know, try and understand it a little bit better. Uh, same thing we've talked about bird gaze, you know, birds do this when birds are walking, you know, you see chickens doing this where they kind of move their head like this, you know. Uh, that may be another means by which birds perceive the world, right? They create a model of the world by, you know, kind of bobbing their head. Uh, pigeons do this too, and ostriches, and all kinds of birds do this. Um, perhaps the reason why is uh, to uh, get more information about things like depth and distance and so on. So when we're talking about movement, we could be talking about a lot of different things. We could be talking about the movement of the whole, the whole agent, just her gaze or her head, or the movement of some object in the world. Um, and idiosyncrasies in our perceptual system will matter as well, right? For example, uh, the curvature of the eye this way will distort vertical lines in a certain way, but it will not distort horizontal lines in the same way. And it'll even uh, have strange, interesting effects, you know, if, if, if we're doing this, it distorts, uh, we're looking up and down, slowly tracking up and down, it can distort things in a particular way. Uh, and remember, we have implicit knowledge and implicit know-how of how to exploit these idiosyncrasies, these features of our perceptual systems, our movement, and so on, to extract more information from the world. That's what Noe is arguing. And of course, uh, I think it should go without saying that different um, sense modalities will display different action to stimulation cycles, right? Uh, the thing I mentioned about, um, you know, the, the angular size when we approach or uh, back up from something that we're looking at, that's obviously unique to visual perception. Um, but um, something similar maybe happens with audition, right? If you're closer to a sound source, uh, not only does the sound sound louder, but the timbre of the sound changes, right? Uh, it, um, it doesn't change pitch, but it sounds uh, a little bit different, right? I'm talking, I'm talking slowly, uh, slowly approaching a sound source. I, there, there wouldn't be a noticeable Doppler effect here. But then again, uh, that's another great example. The Doppler effect is something that we have to worry about for audio perception or audition. You know, you're standing by a, a highway and a vehicle is coming and it's honking its horn. It sounds more high pitched when it's coming toward you and low pitch when it's going away, uh, the horn that is, that's the Doppler effect. Um, we don't really have to worry about anything like that for visual perception because we're just not sensitive to Doppler effects at light speed like we are with uh, the Doppler effect uh, when it comes to sound. So uh, different sense modalities will have different, um, different action to stimulation cycles that we kind of have this know-how. we. We just kind of know how to exploit it because we've been poking and probing the world uh, in, in these kinds of ways since we were all infants. All right, so to try and sum up the strong sensory motor model as succinctly as I can, um, I guess what I should say is that on this model, according to thinkers like Noe and O'Regan and Thompson, and uh, but mostly Noe, this is mostly Alva Noe's uh, theory. According to this, perception is a matter of using this innate knowledge we have of the sensory motor contingencies or sensory motor expectations in all of our various sense modalities to probe the world. So we have a kind of know-how of how sensory stimulation changes, an implicit knowledge of how sensory stimulation changes based on how we move, how we probe the world. You know, a bit like how uh, a blind person who uses a cane uh, will have this sort of expert knowledge, this expertise of, uh, you know, using his cane to probe the world, right? That's like what we do with our uh, eyes and ears and everything, according to no way. So, um, the content of our uh, visual experience and the character of our visual experience um, is a result of the way in which we enact visual perception. The way we enact it is by using our implicit knowledge of these sensory motor uh, contingencies. And Noe thinks that this might offer an alternative to 
the uh, traditional notion, at least, of qualia. You know, qualia, quale for uh, singular, are, you know, those kind of subjective, uh, you know, uh, subjective aspects of our experience, you know, like the redness of red is the overused uh, example. The smell of coffee, this is a quale right here, this light roast coffee. It's really good. I guess um, this is where one of my problems with, with this theory uh, kind of rears its head, but I'll, I'll leave that for a moment. Um, so according to No Way, um, perception uh, or the character of perception, visual perception, doesn't just depend on uh, the exercising of our implicit knowledge of how movement and action and change and all of those things regulates our sensory input or our sensory stimulation. It's also constituted by our exercising of this implicit knowledge. And, and again, this knowledge is a kind of knowing how. It's not a knowing that. It's not like propositional knowledge, like I know uh, that uh, Justin Trudeau was the Prime Minister of Canada, or that my guitar has uh, six strings. No, it's not like that. It's more like a know-how, like how to play the guitar kind of thing. Right? So that's what that is. Um, so, what does Noe say to kind of tie all of this together? Where there's a nice quote from Noe here. Uh, it says, Perception is an activity that requires the exercise of knowledge of the ways action affects sensory stimulation. And I think that is a very nice, succinct way of putting this theory. Now, on to, briefly, some of my qualms with it. All right, so I guess my gripes with an activism aren't really that substantial, and they probably have more to do with my, uh, perhaps lack of understanding uh, of what Noe is actually saying here. Uh, this is to be charitable, right? Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm spelling out just a couple of minor gripes, but I'm also trying to be charitable at the same time. Now, um, uh... I'm not sure if this really does offer a um, alternative to traditional notions of qualia, right? And the reason I say that is while there are some obvious ways in which sensory stimulation changes depending on how we engage with the world, other um, kinds of sensory stimulation don't seem to change. Uh, even when we change how we engage with the world. This was pointed out very well in a paper I read uh, in graduate school, uh, actually in a class on consciousness and action with uh, Carleton University's very own Dr. Murdo Milopoulos. So uh, do check out some of her work on this. Uh, she has much more expertise than I. But... Um, Anyway, Jesse Prince, in this paper, uh, you know, asks kind of sardonically, like, how is, uh, you know, how is my, how are my sensory motor contingencies supposed to explain all of the phenomenal character of visual experience? I'm paraphrasing here. But he asks at one point, you know, do we smell different smells differently? And I thought that was a really great way of really driving this point home. Um... Some things, like perspective and whatnot, uh, granularity and these things, do certainly change depending on um, how we use our sense organs and how we probe the world, but other things don't seem to really depend on that, at least on a first pass, I suppose. So, I don't know. I mean, well, I guess this isn't really a, a gripe so much as it is a I need to... I need to try and find out what Noe actually says about this. I need to look into what he says about qualia and the debates around qualia in more detail. But the other thing that kind of seems weird to me is that, uh, and again, this is graduate school musings. I haven't thought about this deeply since I took this consciousness and action class. Um, but it seems to me that um, a lot of the character and content, if it's coming from the way that we employ our sense modalities, uh, a lot of the character and content of our experience uh, 
doesn't necessarily come from the way that we use our, our implicit knowledge of sensory motor contingencies, but actually seems to come from the world itself. And um, again, I'm not sure if I'm reading No Way the right way here, but this would seem to imply a kind of direct realism, which I'm not really that comfortable with. Um, so while I think No Way certainly has something to offer um, with respect to inner representations being insufficient to tell the whole story, I also don't think that sensory motor contingencies are going to tell the whole story. I think there's probably a mix of things going on here. Some of it's going on in the head, and some of it's going on in these sense modality world loops that I mentioned earlier. But, as I said, um, as keenly interested in perception and consciousness as I am, I am not an expert when it comes to the anactivist theory of visual perception. So um, I hope I've done an okay job at presenting a kind of bare bones account of it. But keep in mind that um, uh, there may be things that I myself am not interpreting correctly here. And I'm trying to be charitable uh, in, in my criticisms, but, you know, I, well, these aren't really criticisms. They're just sort of sticking points, I suppose. Sticking points that I need to resolve by, I guess, learning more about anactivism. But at least now you're all aware of anactivism and the strong sensory motor model. And if you'd like to dive further into this chapter, perhaps for your essay or a bonus critical response, then go ahead and do that. And hopefully this will be helpful. All right, so that is it for our very, very, very brief lecture on inactivism. I've tried to keep this one very short. I hope that I have succeeded. We'll find out once I've finished editing this video together. Uh, but in any case, the final lecture is going to be about consciousness, and we're going to try and wrap up the course. It's not going to be a long one. I'm basically going to look at selections from Appendix 2, which is all about consciousness. And I'm going to focus specifically on uh, what David Chalmers calls the easy problem and the hard problem of consciousness. And then we'll talk a little bit about what Clark calls the meta-hard problem, which he thinks is the real difficult problem for those who want to understand subjective consciousness. So, uh, this will be a short one. Again, it's to kind of make you aware of interesting things that uh, perhaps you'd like to study further in your future scholarly endeavors. And we'll wrap up the class by briefly, briefly, briefly going over the conclusions that Clark draws in the final chapter, which is, um, I think, like two pages long. So not a long uh, lecture this time, definitely not a long lecture next time. So that is all for today. I hope you're all uh, continuing to stay safe and healthy. Hope you're all working on your essays and digesting the material from these lectures and from our textbook. And I will see you all next time for our final lecture. Bye for now, everyone.